I mean, you're, you've clearly gone with the um, uh, a trailer trash vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you go, uh, Jimmy, this beard is professionally trimmed. I'll have you know. Oh, God. It's true. Well, what is, can I ask what that profession is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Jimmy, what's up, bud? <laughs> right, what's up, brother? How you Nothing doing? Other, I look fucking terrible, but yeah, you know, good. Nobody looks good on Zoom, man. Nobody. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to like he humanity. Said, he said looking fantastic. Yeah, right. <laughs> Stop, but go on. Stop, but <laughs> go on. So are we on? Is this exclusively we just talk about KFC and our experiences in the restaurants? What, what are we doing? What, what's the <laughs> God, I've, I've said it a thousand times. It's the worst named podcast in the history of the world. It's my initials. Yeah. I just threw it out there. Like we started it 10 years ago before yeah. podcasts. Were... Before KFC was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, blame my parents. I don't know what they were fucking thinking. Naming a kid, you know, KFC existed back when I was born too. And they still, you had, you must have, there must've been a lovely stage early on where you thought, wow, they've got merch. With my initials. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you know what? I, it's a real testament to just how toxic of a person I must be that they have never even come close to approaching us about an advertisement deal. Not even once. So no, but, but they are in litigation with you over, over <laughs> branding rights. God love you. Let, I, I feel like we've already started. Let's just jump right in. Yeah. Let's, let's just do it. Uh, we, we have to uh, extend you congratulations because you, um, you are now a member of one of the most exclusive clubs on the internet. I don't know if you remember last time we did this, you did a, uh, our YouTube show called Answer the Internet, where you answer all sorts of stupid questions. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you are, uh, I think, one of like eight people to be in the Million Views Club. You cracked a million views. So I Huge. know that's got to be like the most, you know, prestigious moment of your career, right? Well, listen, I'll, I'll tell you about, uh, it's really, I wrote a book called um, Before and Laughter, and it's really about the, the turning points in my life. And that was really one of the big, I just, I remember doing the podcast. I barely remember who you are. I mean, no, of course I don't remember that. Frankly, <laughs> frankly. I'm it is one forget of the more forgettable things that a person could ever do. It's answering <laughs> truly the dumbest questions that you've I, ever been answered. Here's the thing. I've forgotten what we're talking about now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I feel you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, that's, that's kind of great. I mean, it's, it's weird how, I mean, you did this, what, 10 years ago you started this. So it's weird how you kind of, you, you, you got in there early on the podcast. Thing. Yeah. It's become huge. And I think people just love it. Like that thing of like, it's just listening to good conversation. It's just yep. fun. And good conversation. And this, there's got to be variety. Hasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> there's something that happens. Uh, you know, we are, we're in a position where we can say whatever we want for the most part because we don't have anything to lose. But uh, we've we've just seen that like when celebrities and actors and, and comedians and people like yourselves get in the room with a podcast, they kind of just seem to forget what they're doing and they just start to talk freely. And it's awesome. Well, and I love it. But th there is a weird thing here where like we have a thing here, the Daily Mail, which is pretty big globally, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And all they're doing now is listening to podcasts and taking little tidbits of the conversation and going, that's a news story. They'd never, you would never say it in an interview, but somehow on a podcast, you feel like, sure, I'll talk about stuff. And like in an interview, you'd be very guarded and going, I actually don't discuss my private life, but right. it's just a friendly conversation. It's kind of, it's, it's interesting the access that it gives people to, you know, if they're vaguely interested in comedy or whatever, they can really get behind the curtain now and see, you know, inside baseball. We, we've started to get a lot of, uh, you know, like publicists will reach out first and be like, Okay, he or she will do it, but you can't talk about this and you can't talk about that and make sure you say this and frame this like that. And it's like, mm, it's not how we do it. This is not. No, no, we're not agreeing to that because whatever happens is whatever happens. So are you saying that you didn't get the. Because oh. <laughs> also, I know this is on Zoom, but I feel like you're making eye contact with me and that. Not, <laughs> I'm looking no. right at. You know what I'm actually looking at? Your teeth. You got great teeth, brother. Look at those things. <laughs> They're amazing. Well, it's because I'm I'm British, and it's the it's your expectation has been exceeded. <laughs> yeah, big time, big time. <laughs> you're, you're expecting me to have like one functional tooth that I could open a can with, but <laughs> I got like a grill put in there. <laughs> this is actually well, we my first time recognizing that. You, sorry, go ahead. 
No, no, I was, I was going to dis- discuss your, uh, your, your, your looks is, I mean, you're, you've clearly gone with the, um, uh, a trailer trash vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you you got, this, Jimmy, this beard is professionally trimmed. I'll have you know. Oh God, it's true. What, what can I ask? What that profession is? <laughs> <laughs> it was professionally trimmed by a mechanic in the, the auto shop. <laughs> yeah. Whereas you've gone for you've gone for some sort of a, a, a made over Josh Homme is the look, isn't it? It looks like it's Josh. Who? Josh Homme, you know, Queens of the Stone Age. No, I don't know them. Dan would be very upset about this, but I'm not a big Queens of the Stone Age guy. What? I, I, I get I get. I look like a lot of people. I think this is my first no, no, time for... God, not you. Christ, not you. You look like someone's <laughs> drawn a face on a thumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kevin looks like this guy. Yeah. You know what? I, think, I don't know if you can... Can you see that, John? I can see I that. I can see it a little bit. Yeah. You look like... Less angry Josh Homme is what you look like. Okay. Oh. I, you listen, well, if you're that telling means me I look like the, the hell of an angry. actor, because guess what? He's more angry. If, yeah. If, yeah, that, yeah, the less angry, that's not true. But if you're going to tell me I look like one of the front men of an of a awesome rock band, I yeah. will take it, man. I mean, I'm liking, I'm liking the Amwa in the background. There's not a lot of that going on in podcasts. This is interesting. <laughs> I'm actually, Jimmy, I'm on vacation right now. Too, so I'm in a rental house. So this, this, I took time. I was like, we can't miss the great Jimmy Carr. Had to take time out of the day. There's a baby with an earshot right now. So he's going to learn a lot. And, uh, and that's where this is. I have a very non-decorated room because it's a rental so, house. Sorry, you, you have a child now. No, no thank no, God, no. No, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would, I mean, he, he is the child. Now, I thought social services had let us all down. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, I've never even had sex. It would be impossible to have a child. Yeah, well, I, I've had a lot of sex, but it's not possible to get someone pregnant the way I do it. <laughs> oh. You know, if, if your mother's comfortable discussing it, just, you know, fine. <laughs> this is why you're in the Million Views Club. This is why, Jimmy. Okay. Uh, what, what are we talking about today? What's going on with you guys? What's uh, what's No, what I, what, I, what I was interested in, and I'm wondering if it's more of... Um, if it's serious or if it's more of a joke, um, you said that you, one of the reasons you wrote this book was because you want to be able to give advice to your son and you're, you're afraid you're going to be too old to well, really do it when he's of age. I, is that well, tongue in cheek or is that real? No, that's a real thing. I yeah. think I'm an older dad, although I pointed that out to my friend Jim Jeffries. I said, look, I'm an older dad. I'm having to kind of, you know, work out just to keep up with this kid. And then Jim went, you're not an old dad. What you need to, you're just in the wrong place. You need to move to LA where you're a young dad. Uh, how old are you? I'm like uh, 49. And how old's your kid? Two. It's a little bit older, but yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah never I mean, mind. You're, you're, you're old. You're all, you were all ready to go, hey, you're not an old dad. I absolutely like, oh, no, was. You actually, you actually bloody are. Well, you know <laughs> what? It's because you look great. So take that as the compliment. Thank you very much. This is there's a homoerotic I can't quit you undertone to this podcast today. Which I, <laughs> almost, not to, just welcome today, to the Throwback Mountain special. We all really like each other. Um, no, there is something on the. Yeah, I wrote this book kind of before and after. It's kind of it started off as a biography just to take that sweet sweet publishing dollar for the celebrity biography because you know I've been I'm on telly a lot in the UK and people are kind of vaguely interested in my stand up and stuff. But but it turned into a self-help book because it was talking about all the most interesting things in my life were kind of the pivotal, the changing points of like, well, how did I get into that? And what was the thing that changed? And I figured the thing that actually changed was my disposition, like what I believed to be true in the world changed and then everything changed. So I went from going, well, I'm not the kind of person that has an interesting life to going, yeah, I'm one of those people. Mm-hmm. And just kind of You know what is interesting about that? Just that whole idea right there is something that like nobody can do anymore. Nobody can change their minds. Nobody can be like, I used to think this, but now I've learned something about life. And I think the total opposite. They take it as, you know, they dig their heels in and they argue on Twitter about it, but they don't. I've got a quote in the book from uh, the Beastie Boys. Um, And they, 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 uh, I think it's, um, I'm I'm just trying to uh, work out which Beastie Boy, but it's basically says that someone critiqued him for being um, misogynistic in the, in the eighties. And he went, and they said, uh, and then he was being very right on and cool. And they went, you're, you're a hypocrite. And he said, well, I'd rather be a hypocrite than the same person all my fucking life. Absolutely. Like, you, you oh, you flip-flop. Oh, yeah. 
You know, fucking kidding. I flip flopped. I was 23 when I said that. Now I'm 35. Like, yeah, a lot of shit's changed. And so is my viewpoints. I think that thing about politics, I mean, you've got to remember, like uh, Obama ran on a no gay marriage ticket, but he changed his mind. I think if you like one of the great questions in life, one uh, here, I'll put it to both of you guys, right? It's one of my favorite questions in the world. What is the last thing you changed your mind about? Well, I was going to have cereal and then I decided to have donuts a minute ago for breakfast. <laughs> well, that sounds like a terrible decision. <laughs> <laughs> your, your colon is not going to thank you for that decision. <laughs> the, I, I, last thing. Um, um, well, no, I mean, I, I've definitely kind of done, uh, I've come around on the whole cancel culture thing. We're in the beginning because we were bloggers and, and podcasters who were saying ridiculous shit and we were getting criticized. And there was a time where I was like, if you're trying to be funny and that's what, you know, your intent, it means everything and you should be able to say whatever you want. And then I've kind of come around on the idea that you can't say literally anything you want at every single moment of the day without experiencing some sort of, you know, consequences or backlash from it. But Hey, you know, freedom of speech was never, freedom it's a freedom to say it not freedom of consequence right right and Nothing, nothing's free of consequence people have the you know freedom to say i didn't like when you said that my problem with cancel culture is that it's not as good as religion i'm i'm a i'm an atheist so i'm, I'm i live in a secular world and I, I look at religion i go you know we're we're fucking up they do it better than us because when you look at religions they have a metric uh, a, so a mechanism for forgiveness and redemption and a way mm. back we don't have that. Once you get cancelled, you're yeah. cancelled forever. Mm -hmm. Or once you get publicly shamed, you know, like Monica Lewinsky is still that girl, Monica Lewinsky. That moment is like frozen in amber mm -hmm. and it just keeps on recurring, recurring, recurring. What do you think you are? What, in terms of uncancelable? No, no, no. Uh, if, if, what do you think people are going to remember Jimmy Carr as? Oh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think there's that, there's that weird thing about... Um, uh, wanting to leave legacy. And I think that's, I, uh, my theory is that it, they're religious itches that we're trying to scratch in a modern world. I think fame has replaced heaven. Fame fame and fortune has replaced heaven. So that's a wow. place where you go, I, I, everything will be okay if I'm famous. And, it, you know- It's not, I'm, by the way. I, I'm rich and famous. <laughs> can tell you that you 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 don't have the same problems but you have a different set of problems Absolutely. you know it's not the land of milk and honey but that's the promise and the idea of legacy and what you'll be remembered for is is kind of the idea of immortality that's right. the idea of i will live on so i do like that theory when people i talk a lot about grief in the book and uh you, you know that idea that you die twice you die when you die and you die the last time someone says your name and so I think when you when you chat to friends, there's a little lesson in the podcast. If you chat to friends and they say, oh, I lost my mother, ask them their mother's name. So what was your what was your mom called? What was she called? And you could toast or no, you don't need to toast them, but you could just take a moment to go, well, that, that was a person and you recognize that they lived. And it's like a little mini celebration. Yeah. Look at the, Jimmy Carr dropping wisdom on us. Sure. You, sure. I, I remember reading, I think it was Conan in you I, I know. Read. <laughs> he can't he can't read he just said this he's been trying to read and he's learned that he can't bro i meant i saw a tweet i wasn't reading a book don't be ridiculous <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> um that's what i read means in 2021 yeah um but it was it was during conan doing a tour for his last show and i think he was interviewed the new york times and he said something to the effect of um you have to remember that everyone's grave goes unvisited or whatever and he said he had that. That was a very freeing moment for him when he stopped worrying about his legacy, when he stopped worrying about when the last time someone has says his name will be. And he was just like, I'm just going to do my thing while I'm here. And I that, think that was there is something about like this as well, like, you know, podcasts and comedy. I think comedy, you know, I, I've just done a special that drops on Christmas Day for Netflix. And you're very proud of these things. And it's something that will be, you know, hopefully be there forever. But you go, well, there's, there's, it's, it's of the moment comedy. It, it kind of, it, it rots. You, you know, no one's really, other than people like me, real nerds, are looking at comedy specials and albums from the 60s. No one's right. looking at that anymore. So you go, there's a, there's a now to it. That's, I think that's great as well. I think that's to be celebrated. It's quite kind of Buddhist. It kind of lives in the moment. In the moment, yeah, yeah. Do you, you look back at your old comedy and, and think it ages well, or do you cringe, or do you try, do you I, think you try to do comedy that, lasts forever or do you just do it in the moment I, i'm very conscious in specials i don't do a lot of topical stuff so i limited myself like on this last special like i did like 
I'll do five one-liners about COVID in a minute and a half, and then we'll just walk away from that because otherwise it feels like the whole thing is like, you watch a special, someone's talking about this Bush guy's an idiot. This, right. uh, this, this Jimmy Carter's not going to last. And you go, right. ah, dude, it means anything anymore. Um, but I'm a little bit conscious of that, but then it's, it, I'm aware that I look back at the early stuff and you go, oh, I'm trying to get better. I've been doing a thing recently where I've been trying to, I'm a one-liner guy, which is, oh, I have to get the, I have to, one, can I pause this for one second? Sure. I'll be one sec, sorry. I can't tell if he's getting us right now or something. What? I can't tell if he's doing something to us right now. I know, I was, I was I, I, like, are we getting pranked? Yeah. I'll be honest, I thought it was Jim Jeffries. I didn't know it was Jimmy Carr. I thought I got the wrong guy here. Oh, hey, oh, Jimmy. Hey, I'm back. Sorry, some room service arrived. At the, uh, what's he going to say? Oh, yeah. I'm working on a thing at the moment. I've been a stand-up comic doing kind of one line stuff for 20 years, and I'm working on a thing now where I'm trying to put together longer routines with lots and lots of jokes from different angles and then kind of a bit of a point at the end. So like proper stand-up routines in that kind of traditional sense. The thing that I love about stand-up is it's a task without end. And that's where I think you find happiness in life. Like I'm trying to be a better comic and there's no point at which I go, right, I'm a better comic. It goes forever, right. Yeah, It goes forever. And that's kind of where you get, you get happiness from those tasks where you go, well, that's just a road. Oh, really? Because I feel like sometimes that feels very Sisyphusian to me where it's like, I almost want there to be an end goal because otherwise it just feels I mean, Sisyphusian to your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Sisyphus, Sisyphusian. And then the hill, it rolls, then it rolls down, down and then you get to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, 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 no, yeah. You had a job. Yeah. That's what a fucking job is, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that thing of like getting especially when you, cause you, you know, we get to tape specials and things. You look back at the early specials and you go, Oh my God. I, like I still find it funny. You've forgotten to, that you wrote that joke, and your mind still goes to the same place. Mm. And you go, oh no! But I would do, I would do a slightly different thing with it. I would, I would take it further down there. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, you you can see that you're getting better. It's, um, it's it's interesting. I find it like a. I want that for everyone. That was the other reason to write the book. Is quite, um, I suppose, uh, there's a, a tiny bit of altruism in me, a tiny bit, and I liked the idea that. I, I think there's two great adventures in life. The first one is finding your purpose and what you want to do. And the second one is pursuing it. And a lot of people never get to find that thing where work is more fun than fun. And I mean, we, I would say that the vast majority don't. Yeah, people don't get to find that. And it's because it's the unthinking rules of like, okay, well, I've got to get this job and I've got to do this thing. Most people are in that on that hamster wheel of, they're working in a job that they don't like in order to buy stuff they don't need to impress people they don't like. Right, it's, right. That, yeah. It's crazy. And then you go, well, how much would, it, you know, I, I'm all for people following their gene, dreams. I suppose what I like, I go on about this a lot in the book about finding your edge. What's the thing that you find easy that everyone else finds difficult? What's the thing that you do best? And mm-hmm. it's not like best in the world. You know, I'm not the best comic in the world, but comedy is what I do best. Better than That's the average, what, Yeah. So, well, no, but even never mind the average, just better than I do anything else. Better than I do. Okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to beat anyone else. I'm trying to be better than I was last year. That's the whole, that's the trick of it. You're in competition with yourself and only yourself. So are these going to win? Are these the lessons that you are like imparting to your son? Or did you give like specific things like do this in life and don't do this in life and go here? Um, there's a few, there's a few specifics in there, a few obvious things. I mean, all self-help books say the same thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll break it down. This is not for you. This is for your friend with a mustache. Um, here's, here's it. All self-help book says prioritize later over now. That's all self-help books. Everything in that section of the bookstore says prioritize later over now, hard choices now, easy life later, right? So as a stand-up comic, if you spend a lot of time writing the show, it's a ball ache to write the show and to try out new material. But then when you record the special, it's easy because you did the hard work. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like it's just true in life. Like, you know, there's old Chinese proverbs. The weight doesn't get lighter. Our backs get stronger. The more work we put in, the easier it seems to get. The luckier we seem to get, the more we do. And finding your edge in life is about that thing of going, well, take what you're what you've got a natural predilection for, what you're a bit good at, add hard work and time, and that's your luck. In show business is a great example because we're buying lottery tickets every time we put hard work in and write a new show. We're buying lottery tickets to the big time, to being more successful. Mm-hmm. And they don't all pay out. Life isn't fair. But some of them pay out. You're increasing your odds every time. 
damn, Jimmy Carr. I did not. I, I uh, expected to get insulted on here. I <laughs> didn't expect to get inspired. This is, yeah. <laughs> you, you got me ready to go through a brick wall here. I thought, I thought the, uh, I thought the self-help was going to be like, um, you know, Make sure you lock the door when you uh, when you're 13 years old and you start masturbating. Not you know learn how to fucking uh, achieve your dreams through Sun Tzu's philosophies. <laughs> well, Who I don't think you are Jimmy Carr. Who do you think you are, Jimmy Carr? Yeah, I'm, I, I think it's like the thing of like I've got 50 coming up and I became a father and I slightly went. A lot of people come to me for advice. Weirdly, I'm a great and I think this is a great thing to be. By the way, I, I kind of give this advice in the book, a very specific thing. If you have a friend that's in trouble, call. Like I've got a lot of friends that like, you know, occasionally end up in the papers and they get in trouble and call them and go, I don't know what to say, but I thought I'd call anyway. Mm -hmm. That's the message. Like the big thing I learned, I got publicly shamed 10 years ago for like tax avoidance. I was like on the front page of the papers. It was big. Bad boy, moved. Jimmy. Woo. How much? Oh, okay. Huh? How much? Oh, millions. I mean, it was a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of money. Fuck the uh, man. <laughs> yeah. And this is me saying this, not, not you guys. There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a lot. I'm looking at the house you rented. I'm thinking a lot for you would be twenty bucks, right? Uh, <laughs> the the uh, but that thing of like going calling on the day, like so if someone has a problem, especially something medical, like I, I imagine a friend friend of yours has a miscarriage, right? And especially as men, we go, I don't know what to say. Just phoning and saying I don't know what to say. That is communication enough. That's saying I'm there for you. And being a foul weather friend is a wonderful thing to be. Every, when, you, when you're riding high and you're having a party, of course, everyone's going to be there. But who are you going to call in the tough times? That's the thing. And I wanted to take a little bit of that kind of philosophy in life and kind of put that into the book and say, well, you know, for the tough times, what's the thing? What's, you know, everyone's got an edge. Everyone's got like something they're great at. What are you, what are we going to do with you? What, yeah. what are we going to find? Because you could do, I, I genuinely believe people can do anything. I mean, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And the whole social media world that we live in now is making us feel terrible about ourselves. Yeah, big time. Because, you know, you only see the best of people. You, you compare your insides to other people's outsides. And even that there's a weird thing going on now that I find quite funny where people are getting jealous of themselves because they see them, their Instagram, they look at that Instagram and they go, who's this person that's always smiling and always sucking their stomach in mm. and always having a great time? And hey, it's it's always at six o'clock somewhere drinking. And then they look at their life and they feel kind of depressed and anxious and go, who is this? It's not a fair representation. You point, you point at who? You, you. Oh, yeah, you're up here on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You point at me? Oh, on my screen, you're up there, yeah. What are you <laughs> pointing at me for? I do no, the exact right. opposite of that. Yes. I so the you just hate the, yourself, period. The, the whole thing on the internet where people are going to only post their wins and shit like that. No, 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 no. You never see me post. John strictly there. posts L's. That every all time. I do is lose. Yeah. All I do is lose <laughs> on the internet. I don't want to be. I don't want to be rude because you, you you're a lovely guy, but uh, I feel like just just a selfie of you makes people feel better about themselves. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this though: What do you think about John's forehead right now? Uh, I uh. That's a that's a that's a fine looking forehead. There's nothing the matter with that. Tell, <laughs> tell him, uh, be like, I'll give you uh, uh, all of the money that I avoided in taxes if I if you can just raise your eyebrows this high. Because he can't, because oh. he's loaded up with Botox right now. All right, had a bit of Botox, did he? Oh, big time. Oh, big time. His first dose. He can't. It is, but I describe that as like, how was that the priority? How was the <laughs> how, how was the terrible beard not the priority? I think you could be. You know what? I think despite your fame and your wealth from comedy, I don't think I got it as a joke, Jimmy. It's a classic joke. It's a Botox joke. Haven't you ever heard that joke? You don't you even you don't even get jokes. You dude. get poison in your face for the big laugh, you idiot. Oh, yeah, sure. That's like the guy that ironically buys the flashlight and then yeah. unironically fucks it. Yeah, I've done that, too, Jimmy. You're nailing my comedy. You're nailing it, baby. That's that exactly what I do. You did do that too. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think the, um, I remember one year being at Just for Laughs and they gave all of the comics a fleshlight in the welcome pack. And then it worked so well because everyone had fleshlight material for the next year. Everyone, <laughs> <laughs> they gave me this thing. It was a great bit of PR by those guys. <laughs> <laughs> that is very smart. Yeah, I threw myself to clean it. I just threw it away. But I did try it. 
I'm all for self improvement. I think I think it's great. I think I would recommend a razor. I don't think the beard's really working for you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, because no, my thing with the beard, and and this is smart. You might want to put this in your next self help book. Is if you kind of like don't care about your face, then no yeah. one can insult your face for being bad. You're like, yeah, no shit. I don't even try. If you don't try, then it can't, you know, be a reflection right. on you. It's, it's disarming. If I was all shaved and I looked nice, you'd be like, oh, this guy's trying. He's still ugly. Yeah, so at least he can say, well, if I ever put some work into it, I'd look better. I got my out. That feels like the kind of thing a guy says who cries himself to sleep at night. That feels <laughs> also like correct. It. Also correct. Yes. You, know, you could take better care of yourself. You know you could. <laughs> oh, it's, it's actually awesome. Everything you've said so far, I do the exact opposite. It's beautiful. Like the exact <laughs> opposite. Here's the here's the thing. I think it's that thing of like the, the the other bit of advice I give my son in the book is like that thing of like bullies are not clever. They're not smart. They see who the victims are, and the victims are the people that don't care of themselves. They they don't care, take care of themselves. They don't they don't you know they don't they're not good to themselves. I would say you're not taking care of yourself. You're a Look victim. At you. He just called you a victim. And yeah. out of yourself is the bully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're the bully. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you yeah, you, you, you pretty quickly decided which one of us have a lower self esteem. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the whole time, you're a fucking bully, Jimmy Carr. Yeah, but 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 I mean, I'm not wrong though, am I? <laughs> <laughs> you're a tax evasion bully. That's it. <laughs> I mean, that's that is, I'm, feels like we have a title for the episode. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, there you go. There it is. <laughs> I, I, I got a question for you with the the calling okay. people when they're when they're in a bad spot. Yeah. How many? How many bad spots does a person get? Because I feel like in this day and age, everyone's in a bad spot. All your friends need attention at all times. And you kind of got to be like, look, man, a, li a little bit. Let's just, why don't you just put your shoes on this morning and you handle today. I'll get you. Yeah, there's a lot of mental health, like uh, boy who cried wolf stuff, I think. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think I think we're at the I think maybe it seems that way now because we're just at the start of people talking about mental health. Yeah. No one, yeah. I, like, I'm trying to work on a routine about it at the moment, about the idea of what we used to call mental health. Like if someone was like, literally someone could be suicidal and you'd go, he's really not himself. Right, right. Or, yeah, they're, they're a little crazy or he's annoying. Me, uh, You're a yeah, well, I remember my mother saying, oh, he's got the blues. He's really got the blues. And the guy was like, the guy killed himself. <laughs> killed himself. You go, oh, yeah, no, he really had the blues. Well, that's was, like, uh, I mean, my favorite thing dumps, is. Wasn't he? Really down yeah. in the dumps. <laughs> Gary Gary Goldman with the Great Depression, where he he wrote oh, a, a book as a kid, where it was the tree that could only grow if the tears that he shed was watering. The, I mean, he was like, "This is very clearly an allegory for a depressed child, Mom. How did you not see it?" But they just didn't. I mean, it just wasn't a thing back then, right? Yeah, I think it's that thing where the, I think the crying wolf thing is. It's um, I I, it, I shouldn't say crying wolf, but I just there, uh, I think I think people get. You know, it's like I don't you don't want to compare problems and who has it worse. But sometimes it's like, you know, you, you also have to count your blessings at the same time. You know, not everything is. I think I mean, they've done studies on this. Gratitude is a huge part of and I get where you come from. I mean, you know, so it does feel like we come from a generation that's like like uh, the real men back in the 60s wouldn't mm -hmm. have discussed any of this. They would have drank, drank through the problem and they would have drank and killed themselves. Yeah, I think <laughs> things are getting better. Things are, you know, people are being more open about this and also being around to kind of discuss that and saying, like saying, I feel anxious. It's literally or I feel depressed. It's the best that we have. It literally talking therapy is as good as it's got. And you go and see a therapist because you don't have good friends you can rely on that will talk right. about this. Shit. Right. You know, so actually, if you've got great friends around that you can talk to about this and kind of nip it in the bud, it, it, it really helps. I mean, it really makes a difference to people. And uh, yeah, I think there's a or, or a podcast you can whine to for five, <laughs> seven years. That Why not? Why yeah. not? Just <laughs> chat about it. It's good. But, you know, suffering. It's also that thing of like the, the camaraderie of it is fantastic of going like oh, I suffer with anxiety. And people go because I suffer a bit with anxiety, but I try and see it in a really positive way of going. Look, I've got quite a creative mind. I'm good at writing jokes. I'm good at writing books and things, but I can write a Netflix special. But also I can't fucking switch it off. So sometimes at 5 a.m. I'll wake up with a panic attack because it's your, your, your mind is churning and churning and churning over stuff yeah. and worst case scenarios and what else is going on Yep. at the same time. So it's, it's the, the, it's sort of the yin and the yang of your creative mind. So trying to see it in a bit of a positive way. The, the camaraderie of it is honestly one of the best parts. It's like our generation, we didn't have a world war. 
So we didn't we didn't really get the the boys storming the beaches at Normandy. We don't have the talent to become athletic or have that locker room culture. So it was just like, yeah, man, we're sad. High five. I like that. <laughs> we're, <laughs> yeah. we're sad, bro. I like that. <laughs> we're all well, sad. <laughs> In the, in the in the book before and laughter available on Amazon, uh, I make a distinction between depressed and sad. I think there's a like there's words that get like conflated in our yes. society, right? Big time. And I talk about this a lot because you go depression is a is an illness, right? If someone has it and and the you know the symptom it, it, of that illness is is suicide at its worst. There's an epidemic of suicide in young men, and that's a symptom of depression. That, that's like it happens because of depression and people kill themselves. They got one life and it's too much and they die. It's awful. But you've never said to anyone, no one ever says, I've got I've got lung cancer. And you go, fucking snap out of it, man. Come on. It's a sunny day. Let's get out. Let's get out of it. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. never say that to someone with cancer. But we've all said that to someone with depression. Right. We've all said, I fucking snap out of it. Yeah, going but for stuff. a walk is not going to fucking change my brain, guys. Leave me alone. Hey, I've got a serotonin imbalance. It's a serious thing. But if you're sad... It's circumstantial. It's like, okay, so I was sad in my early 20s. It's more socially unacceptable to say I'm sad than I'm depressed. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's not acceptable to say like to a group of friends to say, oh, I'm really sad. Why? Well, I don't like my life at the moment and I don't like the, the way things are working out. I'm upset. That, that, but sad is great because you can do something about that. There's right. not much you can do with depression. It's debilitating. But, you know, if you have it, I feel bad for you. Some people can white knuckle it. Some people need to see a doctor and get medicated, whatever. But with sadness, you go, is that is this a legit depression or is this is this just, am I just being could I do something about this? What was there? Is there stuff in the book that's a, like funny things that you're imparting to your son? Is there is anything there, funny in this book? Is there anything? <laughs> yeah. well, are there like 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 I, I wrote a blog. I mean, I was so young when I wrote it. It was very it was joking, but also things that at the time I thought were important. So when I first started working for Barstool and I was writing, I did like wisdom I'm going to give to my son. And I was probably 20, you know, five or six with no wisdom to give. But I was like, I went to a tiny college in the Bronx that had no sports and no frats and no, no nothing. So go to a big school that has a big time football program and has, you know, frats and alumni so that you love your college experience. Little things like that, that are just like, don't right. do this, but do that. Are there things like that? Or is it more all grand life, uh, like philosophy? More, stuff? more like universal stuff. It's yeah. more stuff yeah. like, so everyone, so there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, what's a good example? Like there's a lot of stuff about conflated words. So I think happiness is interesting. I've got the secret of happiness in there, which I think is a pretty good thing to have in a book. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. So happiness, I, my theory on happiness is it's expectations exceeded. So really, you, you know, if you want to be happy, just lower your expectations a little bit. Why is New Year's Eve Absolutely. shitty? New Year's Eve is always bad. It's coming up. It's always, it's for amateur drinkers. It's a terrible night out. It's always bad. And why? Well, because our expectations are, oh, we're going to have the best night. It's going to be the best time. What are the best nights we've ever had? The best nights ever are like, it was a Tuesday. I wasn't meant to be going out. I bumped into someone when I was getting groceries and we ended yeah. up in the club. It right. was insane. Yeah. That, that's the best night. So like birthdays, another great example, it's expectations exceeded. So your birthday, there's too much expectation. So it's not a great day. But sometimes when, you know, randomly you got given something as a kid, it's like the best thing ever because it wasn't Christmas. It wasn't this. I think Christmas coming up as well. Talk about mental health. A lot of people have such a tough time at Christmas because the expectation is a perfect Hollywood white picket fence Christmas. Mm -hmm. And no one's got that. Although, Jimmy, we looked this up recently. Uh, the holidays, the least amount of time someone kills themselves. How about that? May. Yeah. Number one month. May. May. Watch out for May. May will get you. Which actually does kind of make sense, though, because as, as tough as the holidays might be for what you explained, you probably are around your family and you still get some happiness or, you know, maybe it doesn't reach the, the level you wish, but you go home or you're around them. Yeah. And then something like a random day in May when not much is going on and there's no holidays and there's, I don't know, just the time that you're like, fuck it. Yeah, I mean, this is a scary thing with with uh, with suicide. I mean, actually, the rates are really interesting as well on the, like, as many uh, as many young women as, I mean, you know, it's the biggest killer of the of under 50s uh, is suicide. What? In the world. Yeah, biggest killer of the under 50s. Holy shit. Right. No one's really talking about it enough. And, and you go, actually, what's a great way to medicate? Actually, podcasts like this. 
comedy shows. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to, to, to medicate. Like if you have a problem with depression, it's great to expose yourself. Yeah, we, the, the amount of people that we get, especially for a show like ours, that doesn't talk about, I mean, we talk about it, but we're not, it's not the focus of it. The amount of yeah. people who come up and say like, you really helped me through a tough time or I wouldn't be here without this. And we're just like kind of fucking around. But if you find the right podcast that you really like and and zone into it, it, it kind of gives yeah, you something. Yeah, well, it also becomes like that regular thing of like, I'm listening to the guys, seeing what they've yeah. got to say. Like yeah. that thing of it's it's a friendship. It works in the same dynamic as a friendship. It's a it's a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, there's there's kind of an epidemic, and and sadly, it's higher rates with men than than women because you know guys are uh, uh, guys are better at it. There, I'll say it. We're good at uh, we're good at practical things like killing ourselves <laughs> terribly. Uh, so it's, you know, I think it's a great thing to talk about because it's, it's, it's also, here's my view on suicide. I talk about this in the book as well. The book's really funny as well. I recommend the book, the book like 9,000 pages long. How many fucking things do you talk about? it? Well, look, here's the thing. Here's the point I make about suicide. That's well worth it. It'll make you go, hmm. It's the permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yeah. Whatever you think is a huge problem now in 10 years time, I guarantee you, you don't even give right. a fuck. You barely remember. Right. So it's that thing of like the saddest things when you read about them, when you see the news story about a 17 year old kill himself because he broke up with his girlfriend. You go, oh, no. Right. right. That's not no. going to be a big deal, dude. Right. Right. That's going to be, that's a nothing. That's a footnote in your story. You but know, like, got- but you know, like John's beard, for example, like that, that's going to, those pictures are going to be forever. You know what I mean? Like those, everyone's going to know that this is what he looks like when he has a beard. And, yeah. Uh, not bad, man. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a woman in your life, no? No, I don't. Yeah. I okay. Now <laughs> you think the beard could be related to that? It, 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 <laughs> no, it look like timeline it, it syncs up pretty well. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you look like. You look like a hobo that's had a makeover on daytime TV. <laughs> <laughs> but he's had the makeover, Jimmy. He's had, he's had the makeover. makeover. Yeah. <laughs> no, they cleaned you up a little bit. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, listen, I mean, to be to be absolutely honest, we've had people promote books before and it's like, yeah, you know, go check it out. This genuinely sounds like a book that would really, really resonate with our audience specifically, too, that I think is probably well, it's, it's a uh, it's a love letter to stand up comedy. It's basically taking stand up comedy as the as the kind of number of the book and go, look, there's certain lessons in stand up comedy. Being a comedian like makes you stronger at certain things. So we get very good at failure. Right. We get very good at failing because lots of things we think are going to be funny. We say them in front of an audience and they're not. And you go, mm-hmm. OK, I'll move on. Yep. And that that failure loop is so healthy in life because people think they've got to be perfection, one and done. And we only ever judge people on results. Right. So we only ever see, you know, Michael Jordan shooting the perfect hoop. We never see the hard work that went into it. We never see the years. We never see the jokes that didn't work, that didn't make it into Chris Rock special. Right. We never see that. Yeah. We just see the greatest of all time nail it 100% of the time. Right. So it's that, that thing about talking about failure. And then I talk about pattern recognition as being one of the great, like the way you write jokes is like, it's you're subverting patterns. And really all of human life is about patterns. You're looking for patterns in life. You're looking for the way things work. Because like, they're little shortcuts, they're little cheats on how, how life operates. I love it, man. It's, uh, it's something that I think really a lot of people who resonate with us, it'll, it'll resonate with them. So uh, good job on you. And, and again, congratulations on the Million Views Club. It's truly it's a million. accomplishment. Of and and, and my mom, she's been talking about your special a lot. So we can't wait to watch it on uh, Christmas Day. I mean, it's oh, my, my mom likes Jim Jeffries better than you. So. <laughs> We're basically this Australian British. It's all the same, same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it comes out on Christmas Day, which makes me feel like Oprah Winfrey. It's like, you know, because of because of my name, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Right? <laughs> I love it. I think if your family watches my special on Christmas Day, please get in touch because it feels like that is that is a that's the measure of any well-balanced family. Let's watch some absolute filth from the British guy. Uh, let's, let's, let's scrap that Oprah joke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, you're better than that. I like <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. You get a car. <laughs> the, the, uh, it's, hey, listen, fa- I'm, I'm friends with failure. We, okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll be in the, jo- I'll take my medicine. I'll be in the joke. I'll think of a better one. That's not in the special, so don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> you are the man, Jimmy. Thank you very much, dude. Well, thanks for having us on. I, I, you know, this is great. We'd love to do it again anytime, so uh, don't be a stranger. Thank you, Jimmy.
I'll be back around. Thanks. Later. If you're watching on YouTube, click here to subscribe so that you get all the new episodes as they come out. And John, what should they click if they want notifications? Make sure you click thumbs up for the like. Hit that bell icon.